Senator Bartlett. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, I'd like to make very clear right from the start my absolute total opposition to this piece of legislation and the opposition of the Australian Greens as a party as a whole. I think it is abhorrent, I think it is atrocious, I think it is demonising, and I think it is very clear that it will not work. Uh, I accept that some, at least, that are promoting this are doing so with good intentions. Uh, I think it is very clear that some who are promoting it are doing so with the worst of intentions to again, yet again, put in place measures trying to blame people who are poor, trying to blame people who are carers, trying to blame people who are disabled, trying to blame people who are sole parents, trying to blame people who are unemployed, trying to make their life even more difficult and trying to build political points around doing so. Uh, we can't pretend there is not a very long history of doing that in Australian politics and in this parliament. Uh, I'm not saying that is the motivation of uh, everybody that is putting this forward, but it's clearly, clearly part of what is happening here. Uh, all you need to do, I know it's uh, a very wise piece of advice people many often say in regards to uh, things online, articles online uh, in the uh, Murdoch Media Outrage Generation Machine to don't read the comments. Uh, but they specifically generate these things to create comments, to create outrage, and occasionally it is necessary to read the comments to see what is out there. Uh, to do so also on uh, other things online, and uh, you don't need to spend very much time to see uh, whenever measures like this are put forward, the stream of abuse that comes forward from people vilifying people who are poor, vilifying people who are receiving income support, vilifying people who are on welfare, and basically revelling in the idea of making life harder for them, of punishing them, of saying they deserve this. Well, you know, if somehow or other we think it's good, it's a good measure for anybody that might have issues to do with money management, for anybody that might have issues to do with uh, substance abuse or addiction, to quarantine compulsorily, quarantine uh, the vast majority of their income continually, uh, then let's do it to ourselves. Let's see how we like it, even with our oversized salaries, to have 80 per cent of that, 70 per cent of that, even 50 per cent of that. Quarantined and told you can only spend this with a card that will identify you at these particular stores who have got this special contract that's making them lots of profit uh, through the people that are owning the, the card. And you, you, you don't have discretion. See how you like it. See how you would make you feel. And for those of us um, who might have issues with money management or substance abuse or addiction. Um, do you think that would actually help? Of course it wouldn't. We've got the evidence. We've got the so-called experiment. We've seen, as uh, my colleague Senator Seawitt, I, do, I don't know if we've been here for the last two, ten years to know that she's been going on for the last ten years about how this does not work, about how it causes more harm than good. Of course it assists some people to be able to have their income managed. Of course it assists some people to be able to have uh, some of their, whether it's their salary, whether it's their social security payments or Centrelink payments, whatever it might be. Of course it can help some people. You provide that assistance where it's needed, where they want it, where they're asked for it, where they've got support around them. As uh, some might know, I don't know, of you here, I, once upon a time, many years ago, I was a, a social worker in what was then called the Department of Social Security. The mechanism to be able to quarantine some aspects of people's unemployment payment or pension so that their rents were paid, so that other things were paid, has always been there. And it's done with support specific to the individual on a case-by-case -case basis. To compulsorily put it across an entire community, or as is attempted through this bill most particularly, the opportunity to do so across the entire country, and that's where this will end up, let's not kid ourselves, and compulsorily put it on everybody that receives income support, mm -hmm. uh, with the underlying very strong implication that uh, uh, they can't be trusted their own money, or it's not really their money, that it's somehow or other somebody else's money, that, uh, that they, they, they shouldn't really have a say on, on what happens to this money because it's provided through uh, government payments. Well, we, we all get paid through 
government payments. Uh, there's no shame in that. Uh, it's something people are entitled to, and much more entitled to, legally entitled to, income support payments, uh, whether it's sole parents, whether it's um, people on disability, with disability pensions, whether it's carers, um, whether it's people with family payments, some of which won't apply in this case, but for many of those others this will. That's a legal entitlement. It's a lawful entitlement. It's something our community, something our parliament has agreed people should get the assistance they should get, um, and for very good reasons. Uh, this inference, and sometimes very explicitly stated, that well, because it comes from a government payment, therefore people shouldn't have a say on what they spend it on, is appallingly authoritarian. We had uh, a very eloquent speech from mm. uh, now ex-Senator Brandis, uh, rather long but eloquent, um, late yesterday. Noting the appalling shift towards authoritarianism uh, on the right and uh, misrepresenting it on the left, I might say, but nonetheless, we'll take that as a debating point. But what could be more authoritarian than a government saying, we're going to tell you how you can spend your money, we're going to tell you where you can spend your money? This is extremely dangerous in all sorts of ways, but it's particularly dangerous right now for the individuals it will affect. And uh, this is particularly relevant to my own state of Queensland because the next places that are being targeted for this includes communities of Harvey Bay and Bundaberg. And I'd like to really pay tribute to the many people in that community in my state, people who are on income support themselves, people who by definition are already struggling, people who in many cases, some I met who are carers long term or on disability payments for long term. If they couldn't manage their money, they would not be alive. They can manage their money way better, I would suggest, than pretty much any of us. I'd like to see any of us in this place try to cope and survive on the amount of income those folks have for more than a month or two. Of course there are individuals that can't do that and they need support, but uh, if you want to group of people in the country who are good money managers go to people who are on long-term income support payments, people who are carers, <coughs> people who are people with disabilities. They'll tell you how to do it far better than a government can, particularly this government. And uh, When I went to Harvey Bay uh, gee, about, probably about six months ago, before I was back in this place, I went there with um, Senator Seawitt, and I'd like to thank her for her um, commitment to going to regional Queensland. Um, it's a long way from Western Australia, but to hear from the people directly in the community. And uh, These people from Harvey Bay and also from Bundaberg, and a uh, particular tribute to uh, Anne Jackson and others—sorry if I've missed out other names—who organised a group of people at a bus all the way down from Bundaberg, came through Jin Jin to Harvey Bay, uh, to a public meeting in Harvey Bay about this very issue. And uh, these were all people directly affected. This was community campaigns from people who, have, by definition, are battlers, who organised themselves, campaigned themselves because they could see not only how it would affect them, but because they could see the, the extreme dangers this, would, this uh, measure has, the damage it would do, the harm it would cause because of its compulsory nature. And let me reaffirm that. It's the compulsory nature of this. It can work for some people in some circumstances with support and with proper analysis of each individual. But to just do this blanket authoritarian control, this delegitimisation of people's control over their own lives on such a monumental scale, how could it, I mean, honestly, how could anybody think that is actually going to help? The majority of people. And those people uh, in Harvey Bay, and uh, I thank um, Jenny Cameron who drove me around and um, Senator Seward around that day, and the uh, others there, um, Catherine Wilkes, I know there were many others, names I don't have, um, and, the, and that public meeting there, I can't remember the numbers, I think it would have been easily over 100. You just got to hear their stories of what it would mean, hear what their lives are like, and what impacts this would have. People are already <coughs> copying the crap of being abused and being singled out, and being vilified and being misrepresented and being stereotyped and being demonised. 
because they're a carer, because they're on income support, or they're unemployed. Plenty of unemployment in those regions, as we all know, and underemployment. Last thing they need is another volley of vitriol from the shock jocks and the corporate media and everybody else wanting to reinforce some myth that somehow they're a piece of crap when they're actually more resourceful than many. I'd use another example in uh, the city of Logan, just to um, the south of Brisbane, as those who are from South East Queensland would know, a, a city and a region that's often uh, unfairly stereotyped as being a high welfare area, as being uh, and all the negativity that goes with that. And I'd, like, I'd like to mention an, an event uh, that, that happened just a few weeks ago on January 20th, uh, a group called the, um, the Anti-Poverty Network in collaboration uh, with the Say No to the Cashless Welfare Card team, organised a day um, of support for people in the local community. Uh, this is also a group that's been sitting uh, outside uh, the local Centrelink offices in Logan uh, once a week for, for many months now, just giving information. They're not handing out uh, uh, pol party political information, they're giving information to people about their rights and how to engage with Centrelink. And if this government wanted to actually help people properly who are on income support payments, how about you fix up the outrageous disgrace, <laughs> unbelievable disgrace, of the non-existent service that happens uh, through Centrelink in regards to people just trying to make a phone call. And that's not a, a, a slur on the staff, the hard-working and um, hard-working staff in Centrelink who uh, have to deal with very difficult circumstances. But come on, I mean, I've already mentioned this since coming back to this place, but 10 years ago I was in this place asking questions about how outrageous it was, the waiting times, the inability for people to get through. These are people that are already battlers, are already uh, on low incomes, and they're being asked they can't get through to get information about their own, their own income. I'd like to see any of us do that. Anytime we've got a problem with our travel allowance or a flight or our salary payments or whatever, have to sit on the phone for an hour before we find somebody who would talk to us. See how long, see how long we'd take before we decided to fix that. But in 10 years, this problem has got a hundred times worse. As evidence was provided to the um, Senate committee into this, um, this uh, mechanism, this compulsory income management, according to the evidence from ACOS, costs about 10,000 per person covered by the trial for a year, for a 12-month period. And the actual cost of the program over the forward estimate is unknown because it's commercial in confidence. Let's not forget that. This is a, it's a bit of a commercial deal happening here as well. There's, there's uh, a valid line of inquiry on that, but I'll, I'll leave that because I want to talk and focus about the people who are directly affected, uh, the battlers, the powerless who are being hit by this. So $10,000 per person per year. Now, New Start for a whole year is $14,000, and yet this government can't, says we can't afford to increase that. It's been disgracefully declining in value for years. Imagine if they put that $10,000 Maybe, maybe they don't want to put it into increasing new start. How about put it into providing proper, tailored support for people? This um, information day, this community day I was mentioning in Logan on the 20th of January, um, simply provided opportunities for people from the community to get support. So there are agencies there. And bring the, the event brought together people experiencing hardship together with a whole lot of services in the area. So agencies such as uh, Multilink, whose uh, key focus is on settlement of, of new people in the community and language support, help for uh, aged and disability sectors, support for children, young people and families, um, programs in focusing on healthy lifestyles for people. There was the, the local state high school who could provide um, Sorry, not the high school, sorry, the Metro South uh, HHS, who uh, provided free dental checks to over 20 children, advice to adults, and in in information about oral health. A uh, number of people received professional legal advice. Social workers helped people who needed guidance relating to homelessness and housing. Uh, an Auslan interpreter assisted with interviews and general translation. Uh, the Life Without Barriers group discussed their foster care program. Uh, and the Retail and Fast Food Workers Union, 
was available to, talk to anyone experiencing workplace difficulties, uh, an area that many people who are underemployed who are on casual work, uh, who are on and off uh, income support payments, have to engage with. Uh, and these services were complemented by the anti-poverty network Queensland Booth, which was uh, run off its feet for most of the day by people needing guidance relating to Centrelink and job network agency issues. Now, all of this was done by volunteers, most of them people on income support payment themselves. So if you have people in a community like Logan who are on income support payments themselves, who can organise all of these things in the community to provide that support for people for free, and the best this government can do is come up with this punitive controlling mechanism to take people's control over their own lives and what they spend their money on compulsorily, no way off it. How about you put that money into doing, providing the sort of services clearly the need is there, and it's left up, left up to the people on welfare themselves to have to organise it and provide it, because it's not being provided to this government. If you want to try and get it from this government, you spend two hours on the phone to send a link and then your call drops out and you've got to call again. That's about the best list lot can do. This is the same tired old script. Pick on the powerless, bash the battlers. We had lots of media coverage about uh, this vehicle called the Battler Bus driving through regional Queensland the last state election. We'll like to see the folks that travel in that bus. We'll be interested to see how they vote on this legislation because it's the battlers that are going to cop it in regional Queensland from these measures. This is a clear test. Do people actually care about the lived experience of the battlers or is this going to be another huge monumental big brother, we know what's best for you, even with the best will in the world? Let's forget about what is pretty obvious political point scoring being done here by some in the government, the old uh, pick on the stereotype of the dole bludger mechanism. It's been uh, tried and true for many years. Let's put that to one side. Let's just look at will you actually support the battlers in their community about helping them as individuals rather than this monumental big brother sledgehammer dropping down over an entire region saying this is what we're going to do to all of you. And if you don't support it, it means there's something wrong with you. It means you're part of the problem. Let's see how crucial people on the crossbenches vote in regards to this. Now, it is important to look at the evidence, and I appreciate that some from the government with good intentions have pointed to people in individual communities who are supporting this measure. And I can understand, on the surface, why individual think, well, people would think, well, this, this might work, other things aren't working, let's try this. Uh, but the big thing is, if it's compulsory, it doesn't work. And I hate to turn into an old social worker 30 years down the track, but the evidence is so long, so long. If you do this, it does not work. It causes more harm than good. But we've got the evidence in the Northern Territory, as I know Senator Seawood has said, uh, with the Northern Territory intervention. You could call that an experiment, experiment as usual uh, inflicted on Aboriginal people. Didn't work. There might, I'm sure there's some individuals where it helped. I'm not disputing that. But overall, community-wise, it did not work. And it cost a fortune. It worked for some of the people that got paid big salaries coming in from outside. It worked for them. It did not work for those communities as a whole. When you're talking about Livingston to the evidence, I will remind this chamber, and I will never forget this, in the period just before I finished in this chamber last time around, uh, when the emergency intervention, the, the tabling of the Little Children a Sacred Report, and suddenly overnight we had to do this massive, massive intervention on Aboriginal people in the Northern Territory. We had to beg and kick to just get a, a Senate inquiry on the Friday before the legislation was, was heard on the, the next week and debated and passed in this chamber. And the Senate committee that I was part of, I think Senator Seawitt was part of it as well, asked to hear from the authors of the Little Children of Sacred Report, the, people that, the report that was meant to be the trigger for all this, and the committee wouldn't allow us to hear from them. Blocked us hearing from the people who wrote that report. We had to have a special phone hook up at lunchtime outside of the committee so that we could hear from them directly, and they said all the things that were wrong with this approach, and sadly, they were proven right. 
let's not repeat that mistake again.